Hi, welcome. My name is Evelyn Vanderhoof. My hidden name is Kajuf, and I am a weaver of the Northwest Coast textiles. Uh, I've been working on a Raven's Tail uh, robe commission, and I've been incorporating both the Raven's Tail techniques as well as the Naheen techniques. And so, um, in uh, my creating the copper shield shapes in this robe, I've decided to um, it welcome people to watch me and to even at their homes uh, weave the copper shield along with me. So uh, right now we're still in the middle of the shield and I will continue weaving. Uh, yesterday I read a little bit of an excerpt out of an essay that I wrote for a book, uh, The Spirit of Our Ancestors, uh, that is published out of the University of Washington that got published several years ago. And I was honored to be asked to write an essay for that, that book. And so um, I read a little bit out of the essay yesterday. And today I'll read the rest. So um, thank you for joining me and I hope that uh, I'm helping you weave better and that um, uh, and encouraging you as I weave along on my rope. So hello. Okay, so as I said, I will continue we uh, reading that essay. I read a little bit of it uh, yesterday and I'm continuing to read the rest today. The five-sided Naheen chief's robe is wrapped with marten or sea otter fur along its top edge. The sides have an attached plated folded braid. The side braid and the shallow V-shaped bottom edge have an added layer of mountain goat wool fringe. The inner design is surrounded with broad black and yellow borders. Borders within basket designs were intended to keep spiritual elements contained. The wide Naheen borders, woven before the inner pattern, allude to the spirit core of the central design of killer whale, eagle, wolf, beaver, raven, or thunderbird. In the Simsian language, the robe is called a Gwishalite. During winter ceremonies of the past, a Simsian chief filled his clan's spiritual role of a Wehalite great dancer. In this role, he would distribute power to initiates of secret societies. The robe with its bold iconog iconography and swaying fringes must have added greatly to the dramatization of the power transfer. The Haida had secret societies also, and chiefs had the role of initiating novices. Eagle and Raven are the moieties of the Haida. The two groups fulfilled reciprocal roles during life's milestones, such as puberty rites, house erecting, funeral rites, and chief inauguration <coughs> feasts, as well as secret society initiations. The Naheen robe was an important part of the chief's apparel for his role in the ceremonies conducted for these momentous events. Winter ceremonies among the Tlingit centered on the, the veneration of ancestors. Clans own the Naheen robes as part of their ancestral treasures called at Ao. Handed down from one generation to the next, at Ao are brought out during memorial potlatches to display affluence and status. The robes could also be held as individual property among both the Haida and the Clinket. Early fo photographs show robes attached to grave houses as well as on totem poles. Some poles even included carved images of Naheen weavings. An 1880s photographer of Chief Skidigit's mortuary pole shows a robe attached behind the missing panel that enclosed the coffin. Robes displayed in the man in this manner memorialized an individual's honor during his life and identified him in the spirit world. 
Wealth, power, and social standing was of utmost importance among the Northwest Pacific Coast cultures. Hosting feasts and gifting guests established and upheld honor for the clans and chiefs of all the coastal nations. Often a hosting chief would cut a Nahin robe to pieces and distribute the fragments to show his extreme wealth. Distribution of blanket sections was an element in Haida winter ceremonies. These remnants were called spirit belts. They were, they were handed out as restitution to guests who had been injured by secret society initiates during their spirit dances. Remnants were later pieced into the headdresses, dance leggings, purses, dance shirts, and aprons. In turn, these too became clan treasures. The ethnologist John Swanton collected stories from the Haida and the Clinket in the early 20th century. These were recollections of myths, legends, and clan origins accounts that had been passed from generation to generation by trained oral historians. Through these ancient adventures, knowledge is gained of how apparel was used within a cultural context. In a story collected from Masset, two Haida chiefs clashed over a gambling debt. Because of this debt owed, one insulted the other by using his image in a disrespectful manner. To reestablish his honor, the other uh, <clears throat> to reestablish his honor, the one insulted prepared to show wealth by giving property away. Zangada is the Haida word for the face saving event. <clears throat> Copper shields, fish oil, and bent wood boxes were assembled. Songs were composed and practiced. One of the first preparatory activities was the weaving of, of a crest robe for the chief. In this same story, the chief wears an earring. And Hayas had in one ear a long earring made of a strung abalone shell. But on the other side, where he was going to speak to the his Lucasless, he was not going to wear one. And when the chiefs and the chief's son spoke to him, he was going to turn the side on which he wore the earring towards them. <clears throat> this was found in Swanton's 1908. This short excerpt contains the intention of one chief to insult the other by not facing him with his earring adored side. This story highlights the power of adornment to communicate. This clan story provides insight into certain designs. For instance, a robe in the Peabody Harvard Museum in Cambridge, Massachusetts has two different geometric designs on each side of the rectangular woven robe. This robe, named the Swift Robe, made from pure mountain goat wool of white, yellow, and black geometric designs, is an early pre-contact chief's robe, predating the Nahin. When the robe is draped over the shoulders, the designs are divided down the center of the back. Viewed from one side, the design is totally different than when viewed from the other side. <clears throat> the meaning of the robe's geometric symbols are lost in history. The clan story, together with this unique robe, gives us clues into additional purposes for donning a robe of unspoken purposes and unspoken messages. Because there are no archaeological remnants of Nahin robes, it is believed to be relatively a recent development, evolving from cedar bark robes and the early style geometric patterned robes now referred to as Raven's Tail. But the time by the time the first explorers to the coast arrived, the Nahin textiles of cedar and wool were already highly developed. Diaries and journals from those early expeditions clearly describe the indigenous apparel. The earliest explorer to Haida Gwaii was Juan Perez aboard the Spanish vessel Santiago. At Langara Island, during his trading expedition in 1774, he wrote in his ship's journal the following observation. <clears throat> All their commerce amounts to giving animal pelts as seals, sea otter, and bears. They also have a white wool, which they extract from an unknown species of animal that produces it. They weave beautiful blankets, of which I acquired four. They are not large, but woven and wrought nicely. <clears throat> Juan, Fray Juan Crespi, a chaplain, a chaplain with the same expo, ex, exposition, states in his diary, 
all appeared with body completely covered, some with skins of otter and other animals, others with cloaks woven of wool or a hair which looked like fine wool, and a garment like a cape, and covering them to the waist, the rest of the person being clothed in dressed skins or the woven wool cloths of different colors in handsome patterns. Artists such as Sigmund Backstrom and John Weber accompanied early explorations and with pen, ink, and pigments produced portraits of the indigenous people of the coast wearing geometric and form-line patterned wool and cedar bark clothing. Unlike the indigenous tribes of the eastern seaboard, contact with European customs did not cause an immediate demise of the northwest coast nation's cultures. The primary intention of the early visitors was trade, not domination. The first 75 years brought about a flourishing of the indigenous way of life. With the coming of the Yatsade, iron men, as the Haida called them, better tools were available. The new tools allowed easier carving of canoes, monumental heraldic, and memorial poles. Hunting and trading sea otter pelts brought many goods to the northwest coast. Ceremonial feasts were lavish with abundant and novel objects of wealth. The European mass-produced blankets were adopted as an important item with a set value. They became an early currency along the coast. Worn over the shoulders, the blanket-turned robe was embellished with ceremonial, for ceremonial wear with sewn appliqued red cloth and shell buttons. These replaced cedar capes and robes that had been painted in the past with red ochre crest designs. The new blanket robes were further adorned with dentalia shells, mother-of-pearl buttons, and abalone shell pieces. The use of the blue-green color and the blue abalone shells were the prerogative of nobility. This may explain why blue, not red, is a standard color within designs of Nahin Chief's regalia. First Nations people assimilated the new materials and ideas into their culture. These changes were reflected in the art of the coast. Human figures with jackets and top hats carved in cedar posts spoke of adventures in such cities as Victoria and Seattle. Egyptian sphinxes and circus elephants were carved motifs adopted from book illustrations and newspapers. Sailing ship imagery carved in argillite told of meetings with traders. Imported sheet copper replaced native coppers in the prestigious Tina. Cotton twine replaced animal sinew for cordage. Blue military jackets were soaked to bleed the new blue color for dyeing the Nahin weaving wefts. Commercial knitting yarns eventually replaced the Nahin mountain goat weft fibers. With the coming of the settlers, <clears throat> and missionaries, a vastly different world view was introduced. European de diseases devastated the population of all the villages of the Pacific Northwest Coast. Shamans were ineffectual against new sicknesses. N First Nations people were encouraged to adopt the monolistic Christian religion. Winter ceremonies did not retain the spiritual rituals of the past. European-style cottages replaced clan, large clan houses. Gone was the stage on which the Nahin robe danced, its message of spirit and prestige. Wealth and defi was defined differently by the newcomer's economic system. Trade and barter was replaced with wage jobs and monetary gain. Creating art for curio, collectors engaged the traditional skills of carving, painting, and weaving. Weavers made miniature versions of the large utilitarian clam, seaweed, and storage baskets for the growing tourist trade. But it was the Chilkat Clinket who continued to weave the full-sized Nahin robe for the latest audience. As fluid and flexible as the defining form line, the Pacific Northwest Coast art continues into this current age of dynamic change. Traditional weavers such as Jenny Clenault and Dolores Churchill as well as Cheryl Samuel have mentored a new generation of textile weavers. This revival has caused some weavers to go further and learn the complex iconography and techniques of the Nahin 
textiles. Teaching and passing on the techniques is a very important goal for present-day Nahin weavers. These, through workshops, classes, and mentoring programs, young weavers are practicing the art. Challenged by the standards set by our ancestors, we take up the threads of traditional skills to weave with fresh new ideas. Designs are inspired by ancient clan crests as well as by contemporary stories from our interactions with the constantly changing world of today. Ancient techniques are followed, but because of using new materials such as the commercial S-twisted plied wefts, some weavers have started to S-twine these wefts to maintain the look of ancient patterns. Others choose to keep the Z twining hand movements. All Nahin woven objects of the past were worked with the Z twisted weft in twining. The contemporary weavers once again are producing regalia so that the dance and art of the people can continue.